Okay, well, welcome. We'll be taking a look at uh, human rights and what God has to do with human rights. And I'd like to begin with a little commercial. I've done this many times. I think some of you may have done it as well, but the International Academy of Apologetics, Evangelism, and Human Rights meets every July in delightful Strasbourg, France. Um, and you can get a diploma in Christian apologetics there. I have one and some other people have. It's a great time, two weeks of intensive apologetics. And a particular draw there, there's the website, by the way, apologeticsacademy.eu. particular draw next year is that no less than Paul Copan. If you want expert instruction from Paul Copan for a couple of weeks next year, it'd be a great time uh, to go. And, of course, some really legendary figures like John Warwick Montgomery, who runs the Academy, Craig Parton, also there. Let me just hand out a couple of those. All right. Thank you. All right. So here's a topic, human rights. We recognize some of these. It's interesting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights includes the right to life, because it realizes that if you're not alive, you can't exercise any other rights. But political and religious liberty, very important, not just freedom of conscience, but freedom of religious action, including sharing your faith and being able to change your faith. Human rights abuses, though, have increased all the while human rights protections have increased. That's one of the tragedies. We've got these instruments to protect human rights, and yet, in point of fact, in terms of genocide and the new slavery, we've never had worse human rights uh, abuses. If you can bear to read it, Kevin Bale's book, Disposable People, which talks about the new slavery, documents some of these terrible uh, facts. But even in supposedly civilized countries, we're facing increasing discrimination against the basic human right of religious liberty. Now, one thing to notice is that we cannot base human rights simply on the laws of a nation. That's what they discovered at Nuremberg, where, to their horror, the reasoning that was used by the Weimar Republic as expressed there by Montgomery, the most telling defense was that they had simply followed orders or made decisions within the framework of their own legal system. And in face of that, Robert Jackson had to appeal to permanent values. In other words, a law above the law, if you know you're Aquinas, right, where he understands that there is a law that transcends merely the human law, and so a whole nation can have laws that are are wrong because they institutionalize discrimination, genocide, uh, or slavery. So since that time, after the Second World War, you have a couple of treatises. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which talks about inherent human dignity. And human rights as equal rights, You have them just because you are human. There is no further qualification. Uh, And then shortly afterwards, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, much of the language is derivative. It's very, very similar and has most of the same protections in it. And as courts, the Hague deals with disputes between nations. What's interesting, though, about the court in Strasbourg is it allows a person to claim that their whole country has violated their human rights. An individual can say, look, within my country, uh, if I tried to share my faith, I was in trouble with the law. And uh, there have been some interesting cases. Greece, because of its establishment of the uh, Greek orthodoxy within the country, has sometimes been found guilty of violating the rights of other uh, believers. So we'll say a little bit about how you define a human right. They're not like just any right. But to begin, what is any right? What's a right in general? We perhaps hear too much about rights nowadays, right? Because it seems that every desire 
is claimed to be an expression of identity and therefore you must recognize it or you are humiliating me. So if one day I decide, you know, there's an inner hippopotamus in me that should be recognized, uh, then perhaps you must recognize that about me and provide me suitable facilities in the local zoo <laughs> at, at taxpayers' expense, perhaps, right? And so, so sometimes when I present on human rights to reactionists, we don't want to hear about rights because it seems that every desire is turned into a right, even incompatible ones, right to life and right to die, right for uh, religious liberty, but also the freedom from religious, uh, religion foundation, in my state, Wisconsin, which claims that they, you ought to be able to live your life without experiencing religious intrusion into your life. So once you define desi- uh, rights by desires, you very quickly get into contradictory rights claims. So you have to think, well, what is a legitimate rights claim? And then what's special about uh, human rights in particular? Well, first of all, uh, certainly not every rights claim is valid. Um, Your claim is justified only if you are entitled to something as a matter of justice. And that means that there is some person or institution who has the authority to grant it. So you can't say, being three years old or a felon, that you have uh, a right to vote. The state gives that entitlement to you. It's, it's their authority that determines who has the right to vote. And they have decided that some people have the right to vote and some people do not, right? So it isn't based simply on desire, but it's based on a competent authority that can grant that entitlement. Now, what's interesting, though, is that most rights, like right to vote or contractual rights, they're conditional, right? Not everybody gets them. Not the same for everyone. With a contract, if you don't enter into that contract, then you don't get its protections or guarantees, right? So they're conditional on various things. What's so interesting about human rights is they're not like that. Really, the only qualification to have these is simply to be human. And if you look at the the language, the preamble... Uh, and also the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, They both talk about this idea of our inherent dignity. And notice the language, the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. It's inherent. So it's something that the state simply has to recognize. The state doesn't create these rights, nor can it take them away. It simply should recognize and protect them. They're equal, well, because we're all human. So differences in class uh, or status or power or anything else are all completely irrelevant. And they're inalienable, right? Cannot be taken away. So even if a whole state decides you shouldn't have them, such as Islamic theocracies, that will say that you don't have the right to change your religion and you'll be punished if you do, right? Um, That is a human rights uh, violation. So you've got these four characteristics. Inherent, you have the right just in virtue of being human. Equal, they don't come in degrees. It doesn't matter how smart or powerful you are. Um, It's not that some people have 90% of them and other people have 20%. They're either or kinds of things. You either have them or you don't, and if you're human, you do have them. They're universal. There are not people who are excluded because they're in the wrong caste or they're in the wrong class or anything like that. And they are inalienable. They can't be taken uh, away. Very extraordinary claim, right? Um, Well, the controversy intellectually about this is, well, how do you justify human rights? It seems that everybody believes in them, regardless of their worldview. People will say they believe in some human rights, and they're all running around trying to protect them, although they believe in different ones. 
the big question is, how can they exist? How can there be rights that are like this, that are inherent, equal, universal, inalienable? What's their source? What is it that grants these entitlements? Because it's clearly not the state. Well, obviously, you might think that it's God, and there's a lot of good reasons to think that it is, but there are other people who will try to claim that in one way or another, enlightened reason can determine a basis for human rights that's independent of God. So that would be a non-theistic answer. So the theistic answer, which especially in America we are familiar with, right, because of the, it appears in the uh, Declaration of Independence and goes back to um, statements made by uh, John Locke as well, although he talked about life, liberty, and, 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 and property, right? But there's, 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 there's clear precedent in Locke's writings. The theistic answer is that they're endowed by our creator. And so God is the authority who grants the entitlements. That would explain why they're the same for all humans and they're inalienable and all the rest. But those who are not theists will try to claim that they're based in nature, somehow discernible by human reason. For example, recently Eric uh, Wielenberg, who talks about godless normative realism, that's his view, tries to claim that human rights somehow uh, are things that human beings have because the very same kind of consciousness that makes you um, aware of the, the moral world also gives you human rights. And so he tries to explain uh, human rights naturalistically. So in that case, notice, sorry, sorry what was his name? Er Eric Wielenberg, uh, it's W-I-E-L-E-N-B-E-R-G. Um, we've got a number of people here who have taken him on. He's kind of the guy to beat right now because he's probably got the best worked out alternative to a, uh, a Christian foundation for, for morality. So notice then nature is the authority that grants the entitlement. You don't need God on that kind of view. Well, just to notice, to, to flash out, why is Christian theism such a plausible uh, founda foundation? As Jürgen Habermas himself, who's not a, a, a Christian, recognizes that this is historically, obviously, the context that favored human rights. This is where the idea comes from. And if you read Locke, it's obvious that that's where it's coming from. Um, these are entitlements. Because we're specially made in the image of God, we're entitled to all those rights necessary to carry out our vocation of stewards of the rest of the world. That's why we're made in the image of God. And notice then, that's inherent. God specially made us in his image, so that is something about what it means to be human. It's equal, doesn't depend on our natural capacities, mental or physical. Universal, all humans have them. There's no human who isn't made in this way. And inalienable, since the source is God, man has no authority to take those rights away. And, of course, this continues despite our fallen condition, just as our duty to be stewards of the world continues. So you'll notice there in Genesis, let us make man in our image after our likeness. After the fall, we still have this special right to take care of the rest of the natural world. And so notice this in Genesis 9, 6, where you, where you clearly have a world that, where all sorts of things are falling apart. And there's all kinds of evil activity occurring. And yet it says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Well, but we have to get through a major hurdle. Especially people who are, are trained in philosophy always like to bring up a certain problem for founding ethics 
in God. Um, this is known as the Euthyphro Dilemma because it goes back to a dialogue by uh, Plato. Now, the context there, of course, was polytheistic. But in the Euthyphro Dilemma, the, 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 the question is, well, um, is something pious because the gods love it, or do the gods love it because uh, it's pious? Well, related to that, and perhaps more in line, for example, with uh, Augustine's view that what's right is what God wills, and what's wrong is what deviates from, from God's will, uh, we have this dilemma. If morality is based on God's will, then either morality becomes arbitrary, because God could will anything, and the philosopher's favorite horrible example is torturing babies for fun, right? It's like, come on, if God willed that, that couldn't possibly make that horrible action right, right? That would just be arbitrary and completely unacceptable. Or morality is somehow independent of, of God, uh, and even he must consult some external standard. Well, if he does, then um, you don't really need to bring God into ethics. Even if he does exist, he's not relevant to figuring out uh, uh, what's right and wrong. You don't need him for human rights and so forth. Just to see what an incredibly long track record this has, just uh, a few years ago, uh, one of the new atheist uh, philosophers, Louise Anthony, uh, uses this example. Um, th this is in the Debating Christian Theism uh, volume, which I highly recommend. It's 40 chapters, side-by-side -side debates between Christians and atheists on every issue. Um, and she's paired off with Paul Copan, as a matter of fact. And she says, look, is that which is morally good morally good because God approves it? Or does God approve what's morally good because it's morally good? And you can see where this is going to go. She's going to say that, well, if it's just a matter of approval, then it's arbitrary because God could approve anything or it's opposite. And so claim that something is right is somehow vacuous, doesn't mean anything. Uh, or on the other hand, if God has to consult some standard, then in fact you don't need God to determine what's right or wrong. It's independent. Well, in response, many, many philosophers, uh, Robert Adams, uh, William Alston, Paul Copan, Dave Baggett. Uh, Dave Baggett and Jerry Walls' uh, book, Good God, is, is, is just wonderful uh, on, on this. Um, that's noted in the, uh, on the back side of your, your, your handout. So first of all, does theism make morality arbitrary? Well, it's true, of course, that being omnipotent, God has the power to command anything. Okay, but would he? Oh, being intrinsically good, a holy being, is not in God's nature to make arbitrary commands, right? Remember, the disciple comes up to Jesus and says, good teacher, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? Who is good but God alone? He is an intrinsically good being. It's not in his, char it's not his nature or character to make arbitrary commands. It's only if you detach God's will and treat it separately from his character that you will conclude that he would will just anything or command just anything. Well, then you might say, oh, but then does that make morality independent of God? Uh, no, because again, what constrains God's decisions is his own nature. As it says in Titus, God cannot lie. Does that mean he doesn't have the power to lie? Obviously not, but being a holy being... That's not within his nature to lie. And so notice it's God himself. This is, this is what Robert Adams says. God himself is the intrinsically good being. He is the moral standard. So it's not, he's not arbitrary, but nor is goodness independent of God either. So this is a false dilemma. Nothing is morally good simply because God approves it. Go back to Genesis. It doesn't say, I like what I did. It says seven times he saw that it was good. Now, why was it good? Well, because it reflects his own goodness, but nonetheless, it really was good. So it was good because he made it good, not simply because he said 
it was. And of course, he does approve uh, of it because it's good, and yet that goodness derives from his own goodness, and so is not independent of him. So, as many uh, contemporary Christian philosophers have shown, the Euthyphro dilemma does not, in fact, work at all. Uh, and at least then, theism is on the table as a possible explanation uh, for the foundation of ethics and for human rights. But you might want to say, well, what about the alternative views? Um, I'm going to just skip this slide here. Naturalism as a secular alternative. So naturalism in, in philosophy just means the natural world uh, is all there is. There's different kinds of naturalism, strict or broad. But certainly, as Alvin Plantin just says, they all agree there's uh, nothing like God or anything else like that, right? That's his wonderful uh, expression of it. So not souls or any other immaterial uh, beings. So if there are human rights, they must somehow derive from nature. And there have been a number of suggestions. Perhaps it's to do with our capacity for happiness. That's the utilitarian view. Maybe it's just a matter of our own law, legal positivism. Perhaps it reflects the fact that we're rational beings in Kantian and now neo-Kantian uh, ethics that dignify rational beings. Or, most popular today, is to define everything in terms of instinct and natural selection. Lots and lots of books out there today uh, in the era of evolutionary ethics. Well, first thing I want to show is that none of these really justify what we began with, the kind of human rights that are inherent and inalienable and universal uh, and equal. And it's very interesting, too, that there are some, and I consider them to be the most consistent naturalistic philosophers, uh, who admit this. Because they point out, look, if you base rights on natural capacities, you see that they are distributed all over the place. Uh, and for one thing, if nature is this unintended accident because there is no God, there is no particular reason to privilege human beings. In any capacity you pick, some human beings may lack it and some animals may have it. And so to privilege human beings and say that all and only human beings have special rights would appear to be, as Peter Singer says, species is an arbitrary prejudice in favor of one natural creature over others. But let's have a look at the, the, these views. I'll, I'll go very briefly over um, the first few because I think it's the evolutionary view that's the, the, the more popular one at the moment. But utilitarianism, right? Basic view in ethics that you should do what is happiness maximizing those actions that produce the most uh, pleasure or pain, are different versions of utilitarianism. The obvious problem with that is, is that we can have what the Germans call schadenfreude. We can unfortunately be made happy by other people's misery. And it may be that there's a people that we really don't like, and we would be a lot happier if they were out of the picture, even exterminated, Right? And un unfortunately, history shows many cases where people would be very happy to exterminate a minority population, and obviously that would be a major human rights abuse. Now, some utilitarians try to get around that and say, yeah, well, that could be a problem theoretically, but in the real world, these kinds of abuses will make people unhappy in the long run. And, the, and they will feel like, no, this shouldn't have happened. So the balance of unhappiness will start to unweigh any happiness that people may have enjoyed at the time. Notice the problem with this answer, though. It means, if that's true, it means that the only reason that genocide is wrong is because the government did not succeed in either brainwashing or eliminating the people uh, who disagreed with it. In other words, it comes down to the view that it's wrong only because of administrative incompetence, 
if they just got rid of all the people who disagreed or, or convinced them that it was okay, then, magically, it becomes right. And that's terribly implausible. And that says nothing of the people that died in the process before this balanced itself out. Yes, very, very good. Yeah, yeah, and all of those things. I mean, you think about the noble uh, German philosophy professors and people like that and their students who stood up against the Nazis and they were killed, you know. The people like that, what about them? No, so I think utilitarianism is a complete failure in the area of, of human rights. Um, legal positivism is an also another non-starter because, in fact, Nuremberg showed that that doesn't work, right? Because legal positivism says that human rights only was, uh, exist within a structure of laws that's being created by a proper authority. Well, but there are proper government authorities that can have institutionalized human rights abuses. They can be made legal, and there are plenty of countries in the world where it's perfectly legal to send people off to the the gulags or to give them second-class status of various kinds, whether it be apartheid or anything else. Uh, And so that simply won't work. State-sponsored genocide will not be a human rights abuse since positive law uh, won't prohibit it in those kinds of uh, states. A bit better would be Kant's approach. That helps, right? Kant's famous categorical imperative where he says you can only do those actions that you can will everyone to do. So, for example, uh, you shouldn't steal because you can't will that everybody steals because then after, you know, a hard day's burglary, you come back and someone's stolen your stuff, right? Right? take a very simplistic example of Kant. And um, you've got people like Rawls, a sophisticated uh, view of justice where he says, well, you only should accept those principles um, which you would be willing to sign on to under a veil of ignorance regarding your special advantages and privileges. Okay? So then you're not going to want to accept something that could possibly hurt you now that you don't have any of those special powers and privileges, and so you will tend to pick equal ideas and and justice that will be equal for everyone. And that sounds really good. And I think it's fair to say that if a human rights uh, violator would follow either Kant or Rawls, he could certainly see that what he's doing is wrong because he can't will that other people do to uh, him what he is doing to others. That's, a, that's helpful. Okay? Trouble is, it's not very realistic because notice the key word, if. Yes. What reason does he have to do this? If, in fact, you know that you have all of this strength, power, and wealth to accomplish your aims... You say, yeah, no, I can't will everybody does this to me, but I know full well that I can do it to them, and they can't do it to me. And furthermore, I certainly have got no reason to go under the veil of ignorance because I'm fully aware of the powers that I have to get my way. So they can simply refuse to do this. So uh, helpful as it is, it's not enough, the Kantian uh, approach to this, this problem. Right, what I want to spend most of the time on, though, is the evolutionary approach. This is kind of like when you go to the United Kingdom uh, and you have these uh, little hole-in-the-wall places where you can get chips with everything, right? Fries with everything. Well, unfortunately, we've got evolution with everything now. Evolutionary jurisprudence, economics, ethics, you know, psychology any field, whatever, has been treated from this, this point of view. So if you applied this to ethics, how would that work? Basically what you have to do, and um, Darwin in The Descent of Man kind of begins this project, is you, is you treat your understanding of morality in the context of natural history. You have to deal with things like the instinct of sympathy and try to figure out, well, how does that develop in man 
so that he begins to care for his fellow man uh, and things of that kind. <clears throat> so what it, what it will come down to is it will have to develop from things that have conferred an advantage. And the idea is that, well, if creatures sympathize and they cooperate, then you'll have a more stable society, more people will survive, more people will reproduce, and that, that kind of thing, right? And there'll be some sort of genetic advantage to doing so. But Darwin realized that there's rather striking uh, implications of this. Here's one of the most shocking statements in The Descent of Man. If men were reared under precisely the same conditions as hive bees, there can hardly be a doubt that our unmarried females would, like the worker bees, think it a sacred duty to kill their brothers, and mothers would strive to kill their fertile daughters. Because that's what hive bees do. If our natural history was different in that way, then all of a sudden uh, fratricide and uh, female infanticide uh, would be thought perfectly permissible. There's a word there, though, think. So it's not quite clear what Darwin is saying. He could just be making a statement of moral psychology, right? That that's how we feel. Or he could be saying, no, then actually it would be right. That would be a statement of so-called moral ontology, what really is uh, right. So the question we have to ask is, in his scenario where we're raised like hive bees, would fratricide and infanticide then have actually been moral duties? If you say yes, that's the strong view. Uh, and you'll have uh, authors uh, who write about moral origins who assume that that's where the moral demand actually comes from, is from instinct. So they would be take the strong view. If you say no, you're saying no, it would affect how we feel, but not what actually is right or wrong. So just to develop that, the strong view is saying that moral truth, what actually is right, what actually is wrong, depends on our natural history. And so if we had been raised like hive bees, uh, fratricide and infanticide would have been right. You know, we've heard about sibling rivalry, but this is getting kind of uncomfortable, right? So say, well, you know, why don't you... Uh, kill Timmy over here, right? I mean, uh, Sarah, Sarah killed her brother. What's wrong with you, you know? It's a little bit disturbing to think that, that the claim that's being made here, that not simply that it would be okay, but it'd be the right thing to do, and you'd reproach somebody for not doing it, right? That's, that was what is really being claimed here. The weak view then would just say what we feel is right depends on our natural history, but what is right doesn't, right? So we'd feel that certain things were right, but it would, that would not imply anything about whether they really were or not. So what we'll look at is that there is really a dilemma, and it depends on two philosophy words. Ontology, ontos is being, so it means the theory of being or the theory of what exists, Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. And so the strong view has an ontological problem, I will argue. It implies that human rights, as we've defined them, can't exist. There are no such things. The uh, weak view is compatible with the existence of human rights. They could exist. But the problem is epistemological. We couldn't know what a human right is is. And so that wouldn't be very useful either, even if they do exist. So let's take a look at the first issue here, the ontological problem. The main problem is contingency. If you take this evolutionary ethics view, then it makes human rights contingent on circumstances. Notice that uh, the Universal Declaration, when it talks about all humans having the right to life, well, on the evolutionary view, it depends. If we had a different natural history, then some people might not have a right to life. Okay? It might be that brothers and female infants, for example, don't 
have a right to life. So we have rights only because of an accident that might not have happened. And we might lose those rights because of future developments. They're contingent now. But that doesn't sound like they are inherent, right? If, if they're inherent, then it shouldn't depend on contingent or accidental circumstances whether we have them or not. Notice the analogy with utilitarianism. The criticism there was, on that view, the only reason genocide is wrong is because of the, you know, the incompetence of dictators. They didn't succeed in getting rid of the people who'd be made unhappy by their program or, or changing their minds. And likewise, if in our world we want to say that fratricide is wrong, well, yeah, but it's only wrong because of a lucky contingent fact. If our history had been different, then it isn't. So it isn't inherent to being human. You have to be the right kind of human, and you have to have the right history on this view. So we can kind of work this out in a little more detail. On Darwin's scenario, only the right kind of humans have a right to life. Some would not have as strong a uh, right to life as others, so they're not equal. So it's not inherent. It's not equal. Brothers would not have the right to life at all. It's not universal. And changes in natural history could remove the right to life. So you can do, first of all, thought experiments. Now, philosophers' thought experiments just confirm the ordinary person's view that philosophers are strange people who spend too much time alone <laughs> with, their, with their books, right? But So first, a thought experiment. And this is not going to happen, I hope. But if the tyrant who's Im impressed by entomology, right, says, gosh, I really like the way tho those bees live. I will now engineer a society where everybody like, lives like bees. If he did that, then at a stroke, some people who currently have rights to life would lose them, according to Darwin's view. Okay, now brothers and female infants would not have those rights. Rights that can be taken away by social engineering are not inherent equal, universal, and inalienable. Now you might say, yeah, but that's a silly thought experiment. Stuff like that doesn't happen. Okay, uh, yes, it really does. Societies have developed in a way which they claim depends on the subordination and exploitation of other people, i.e. by institutionalized human rights abuses. Slavery, both the old and the new form with disposable people. What's horrific when you read Kevin Bell's book is, here's someone's a slave to help you. It, it could be someone forced into uh, prostitution or a child worker. If they get sick, they do nothing. They allow them to die and get another one. It's really horrifying to read uh, the way that they're treated. It's actually worse than original slavery that we think of in, in America and European countries, because at least then those slaves, as, as horribly as they were treated, had certain rights as property. They were expensive, and there were certain things that you had to do to maintain a slave, whereas the new slavery doesn't recognize even those rights of property. Apartheid, child labor, the caste system, I was reading a chapter about that, the lowest section, the lowest caste called the, the crushed they're viewed horrifically as subhuman animals. Nobody really cares what happens to those people, whether they live or die. We've got dimitude in Islamic theocracies, where the, the non-Muslims non are given a very second-class status, ghettos, and so on. Lots of examples. So we certainly have examples in the world we live in where we have claimed that the only way our society can function is by, by denying or giving second-class rights to some people. Now, do we have special human rights? On evolutionary grounds, it's hard to see how, because there are plenty of creatures that are just as adapted to their niche or better, right? If there's a nuclear winter, presumably there's going to be lots of critters uh, doing quite well, uh, but us, not so much. So why think on evolutionary grounds that we have special human rights? 
why think that there are equal rights, right? Human rights presuppose that we have equal worth. But when we look at our natural capacities, they're not uniformly distributed. Some people don't have them because of developmental problems or disabilities. And they vary in degree. Some people are smarter or stronger uh, than others. And so it would, unfortunately, be very logical to treat people differently and give some people more human rights than others and some people none at all. This is still a problem for Eric Willenberg because he bases human rights on certain kinds of consciousness which quite evidently some human beings don't have. Now, why universal rights? It simply isn't true that all human beings have capacities higher than all other creatures. Uh, and this is why, you know, you'll, you'll find that people will argue on naturalistic grounds not only that they have no problem with any kind of abortion, but also uh, no problem with infanticide because they'll say in terms of personhood characteristics in psychology, uh, the, the infant has very little of those, whereas perhaps the adult dog, pig, you know, or whatever, actually has more of them. So if you based your value on those criteria, you would be led to the um, amazing conclusions of Peter Singer that the adult pig is, is, is more valuable than uh, certain human beings. What's disturbing is that we could very quickly lead then to the idea of life unworthy of life. Before the Holocaust, within Germany in the 30s, they had the child euthanasia program that was then expanded to certain adults with psychological, physical, and even social defects, um, estimated to be over 200,000 people. And those same techniques that were uh, uh, learned there were then taken to... Uh, Auschwitz, one of the most sobering experiences of my life. I did this uh, two years ago. Uh, went through Auschwitz uh, one and two in, in uh, Poland, and there were people from all over the world there, and they come in. You know, kids are, and they're laughing, and they got their cell phones. It's like, oh, and then here's this room, and there's piles and piles of hair, and there's teeth, and there's the luggage, and you start to sh see shoes, adult shoes. I think what did it for me was starting to see just little shoes of tiny kids. And then hearing that, uh, and by the way, they also did experiments on some of these people, including pregnant women, and things that just are unbearable. Um, the only way that I can, I can describe that experience is it was as if somebody had, had stabbed my soul. It was just terrible. And these Young, bubbly kids, what was very noticeable, they went through at a certain point, they were silent. It was just like shock, and there's nothing more that you can say. They were, they were really, you know, grieving for this. So there are certain kinds of evil which, you know, you finally just have to see. So you'll occasionally get a very tough kind of skeptic who says that they'll defend, you know, moral subjectivism or some form of relativism. But it really does not. Um, it, it really does not, I think, survive going through an experience like that. So, as well, there's the problem that it commits the, you know, the naturalistic fallacy. If you base morality on natural facts, you're really just going from an is to an ought. And it's well known in logic that that is a fallacious argument. You can't go from the fact that genocide is popular to the conclusion that we ought to commit it. Furthermore, uh, J.L. Mackey uh, admitted, he was an atheist philosopher, admitted that, look, um, if in fact there's objective prescriptivity built into reality, there are oughts, there are things that you ought to do. The best explanation would be theism. Matter does not seem to prescribe. There's nothing in the, nat the natural world is simply a world of contingent happenings. Things just does Things just do happen, right? There's no ought about it because there's no teleology. If you take God out of the picture, no state of affairs is, is inherently any better or worse than any, any other. 
And of course, to get around accepting God, he was then forced to accept the least plausible of all views in ethics, subjectivism, just like Bertrand Russell. All right, so briefly on the epistemological problem, the, the weaker view says it's just our moral sense that's been shaped by a natural history. And, and Darwin here uh, drew heavily on Adam Smith and his work on the idea of sympathy. So if you see someone who's being tortured, you sympathize with the victim and you, and you feel disapproval to, in, toward the, uh, the torturer. That's the idea. That could perhaps develop as an instinct among social creatures, Darwin uh, believed. Well, some obvious problems with this is that sympathy is simply unreliable. Psychopaths don't have it. Other people have it more than others. Mother Teresa was tremendously sympathetic. If you, if you based our moral obligation on that, then it seems some people have much more moral obligations than others. You could perhaps even have drugs, right? Uppers and downers. And if you, if you take the upper, you now would increase your moral obligations because you're feeling more sympathy. The other problem is that if our... Um, it might be that we have accurate perceptions on, of human rights, but if our moral sense depends on natural history, since we could have had a different natural history, we just got lucky. And if you just got lucky, you don't have knowledge. So when you take the multiple choice test and you say, yeah, 23C, right, but you're right by accident, you just said, well, it didn't seem like Professor used C much, so maybe it's 23C. Even though your belief is true, it's not knowledge. If we know something, it's no accident we're right in believing it. So, you know, the classic analogy of the broken clock, which is right twice a day or only once if it's 24 hour, right? So if you happen to look at the clock, you know, when, you know, it's uh, 25 past 3 and it is 25 past 3, then you have a true belief, but it's not knowledge because the source is unreliable. So it, it, even if our beliefs about human rights are true, they're not knowledge because it's a pure accident that we had the right kind of natural history. And so this is why so many people looking at this, most famously Michael Roos, but also Richard Joyce, have concluded that the most reasonable view to take uh, on, on an evolutionary basis is really moral skepticism. Human beings function better if they're deceived by their genes into thinking there's a disinterested objective morality, says Roos and Wilson, or fobbed off on them by their selfish genes elsewhere. And just because it's useful for us from a genetic point of view um, to have a certain uh, idea of rightness and wrongness doesn't imply that there is any such thing that really exists, and so it's not dependent on there being any fact of the matter. So what I've argued is if human beings are simply the result of undirected evolution and that's all there is to us, no being made in the image of God, then the right conclusion would either be there are no human rights or we can't know what they are. 